Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former anchor and Homeland Security correspondent at CNN and former State Department correspondent at ABC, Jean Mazur. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Shoot for the Moon Space. And before I say anything else, there are some other people who would like to say a few words to all of you. Greetings to the International Women's Forum from the International Space Station. I'm Randy Bresnik, Commander of Expedition 53, along with my NASA crewmates Mark Vandehei and Joe Acaba. Welcome to Houston, home of the Johnson Space Center and Mission Control, where astronauts prepare for magnificent journeys like this. The space station is truly an international enterprise, a partnership involving the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, and the European Space Agency. It is here, 250 miles above the Earth, where we work together conducting groundbreaking scientific research for the good of all humankind back on Earth. Every day we see the important impact of international collaboration, cooperation, and conversation. I know the International Women's Forum gets it. You also involve experts from around the globe to solve problems. The world may be divided by geography, but as I look down from space, it is clear we are all in this together. Together we'll find the paths forward to improve our world and explore the universe in the years ahead. My best wishes for a successful Congress and enjoy Houston. How cool was that? I don't know what I like better, the tumbling or the mic toss. That was great. A first, isn't it, for IWF? I like it. Um, just a few weeks ago, there was a headline that proclaimed that America had a new Iron Man, but that Iron Man turned out to be a woman. Astronaut Peggy Whitson, who had recently returned from the International Space Station. Whitson shattered record after record. She was the first woman to command the International Space Station, and she has commanded it twice. She has logged a cumulative 665 days in space, giving her more experience in orbit than any other American, male or female. And particularly meaningful to me, at 57, she is the oldest woman to fly in space. So they call her an American ninja, and our guest today has said that she was very careful never to follow Whitson into the gym because Whitson could bench press four times as much weight. But make no mistake, our speaker today has had a stellar career in the space program. She was the first Hispanic woman to travel in space, and she has made four different flights. She is an electrical engineer who holds three patents for optical systems, and she is now director of the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. Please welcome an inventor, an astronaut, and a pioneer, Ellen Ochoa. Great to have you here. First, I want to do a show of hands. How many of you out there in the audience ever dreamt of being an astronaut? <laughs> okay, a good number. So we have to live virtually okay. through you here today. Okay, so tell us a little bit about it. What was it like and what did you do in space? Well, I had the opportunity to be on four different space shuttle missions and uh, two of them were focused on studying the Earth's atmosphere and particularly um, studying about uh, ozone hole and ozone depletion and trying to understand what, well, what that was doing and effects of humans versus effects of the sun. And then two of them were part of the assembly of the International Space Station. So it's so great to see um, that video from our current crew up there uh, because I did get to help build the station that they're on today. And in fact, we have a video that we can show. Oh, you can narrate it as we look at it okay. and tell us exactly what we're looking All at right. here. Good. Uh, well, we're waiting for that to queue up. We should mention we're going to be able to see the space station if the skies are clear here in Houston tomorrow morning. That's right. right? Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. It's going to travel from southwest to northeast. And here okay. you are. Here's the video. 
So this, is, uh, this was actually my fourth space shuttle mission, again, part of the assembly of the International Space Station. You saw the crew getting ready to go out to the launch pad, um, getting in the space shuttle Atlantis. And uh, I'm kind of the one in the middle there, the flight engineer position, and work with the commander and pilot during uh, launch and entry. Uh, and then once we get up to space, we, uh, one of the jobs that we had was to transfer supplies. So that's a little uh, picture inside the station. Our major job was to start building out the truss structure that the solar arrays uh, now hang off of. And so this was the very first piece, about 40, pe pe uh, 40 feet long. Uh, my job was to operate the robot arm that you see there in the picture, uh, along with a couple of other astronauts. There were three of us who were handing off to each other. You can see us at the controls here. You might notice there's no windows. Uh, unfortunately, as we were operating this arm, we just had some camera views. And uh, so you had to make sure that no part of the arm was getting near any structure. And you got to not be uh, distracted by the camera views that show that's the Nile River down uh, back there and the, and the Gulf of Aqaba. <laughs> but you got you to really focus on what you're doing. Um, and then this is sort of the final part where we're uh, bringing the uh, piece of truss uh, to attach to the very top of the station. And you can see this claw that's going to grab on and make the very first mechanical attachment. That's Dan Bursch, um, one of my he, he was already living on board for four months when our crew came up to work with the crew on board to, uh, to do this task. And then uh, after that, we spent about a week at the space station. Uh, we had four crew members who went out in groups of two doing spacewalks. I was operating the robot arm during that time because they would get um, onto the actual um, arm to do some of the spacewalks. And what we were doing was actually making the final structural attachment. So we were attaching some of the struts. And then we really had to power up all the equipment on this, which uh, we had to hook up power cables and make sure we had computer connections, because it was going to help us distribute all the electrical energy uh, to, in order to operate, really, the whole station. It's hard for me, for me to imagine the kind of pressure you must have felt to do this job and do it right. Well, you know, one of the things that we do uh, as we're preparing for flight is we spend all our time in training, really. And so a lot of it is it's not just here's how you do what you're supposed to do, but here's how you do when this fails and when that fails and when there's three or four failures in a row. So a lot of that is really um, allowing you to understand that you can deal with a lot of the issues that might happen while you're up there and you're, and you're well prepared to uh, do that. So how long would the training for a mission take? Well, um, once you're actually already assignable, which means you've gone through a lot of the basic training and, and learned about the systems, then it was usually anywhere from about a year to a year and a half for these shuttle missions. It's longer now when we um, train people for the International Space Station because they do train around the world, uh, and there's a variety of different things to train on. So talk to me a little bit about the training to use that arm. That oh, okay. You were expert. Yeah, at. we we do we do a couple of different types of tools or training that we do for that. Um, we actually, at the time when I was training for it, although we don't have it anymore, we actually did have a, a, an actual mock-up of an arm. It was hydraulic instead of electric, which is what we have on the, um, on the shuttle. But um, it, would, uh, it would give you that sense of like how long actually is the arm, when, when am I near structure, and that kinds of thing. But a lot of what we did was computer simulations. And so uh, it would be designed to have the same kind of dynamics as the actual arm. And so we go through a lot of computer simulations. So we saw the video of you taking off and those powerful engines and everything shaking. And you're sitting on a big bomb, essentially. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of fuel underneath you. Are you aware of that? Are you fearful at all as you're going through that experience? Well, that's not really what you want to concentrate on, you know. No. Um, so, <laughs> but can you avoid? Can you avoid thinking of it? Well, one of the things that happens during launch is um, we have these various different performance calls. So, um, for example, if you were to lose one of the main engines at a certain time, you would go into one kind of abort, and if you lose it later in flight, you would go into a different kind of abort. So what you're really do a lot of what you're doing during launch is you're listening for the support calls, you're watching your altitude, you're watching the airspeed, and um, because you would take different actions depending on if you had an issue in, during these different times. Now there are some things for which you really 
there isn't a whole lot you could do. But there are, there are a lot of different kinds of smaller failures for which we are trained to respond to. And so you're really sort of focused on that and, and prepped to, to do something if, it, if it's required. What was your very favorite part of being in space? Uh, it's, you know, it's like asking what, what, who's your, which one is your favorite child, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, the, the view of Earth from space is just, you know, overwhelming. It's just uh, spectacular. And I think w with the high-definition cameras now, we have a lot better way of showing people on Earth, but it's still not quite being there. So that's certainly a favorite. Now, I've read that other astronauts have had sort of philosophical or religious awakenings when they've had that view of Earth from space. Did anything like that happen with you? Well, you know, I think uh, actually the, the theme of this conference, Global Citizen, it kind of comes to mind because, you know, you're going around the Earth every 90 minutes. Um, you're passing over all these countries and continents. In most cases, you can't see any borders. You see how thin the atmosphere is, and that's what really keeps us all alive here. So you, you just, you do get that change in perspective about how we're much more connected, how we depend on each other. And, um, you know, I think it was Marshall McLuhan that said, you know, there are no passengers on spaceship Earth. We're all crew. We're all responsible for, you know, making sure that the Earth stays in a way that we can sustain, sustain ourselves. So, so as you mentioned, you're traveling around the Earth. What happens to your circadian rhythm? Well, so we do have either a sunrise or a sunset every 45 minutes, so you don't want to... That would be confusing. You don't want to <laughs> keep getting up and going down, uh, depending on when it's light or dark. Um, so really what we do is we keep crews on a regular 24-hour schedule. So you get up, you have some time in the morning to, to get ready, eat some breakfast, go through all the morning uh, messages about what you need to do that day. Then you get into a regular work day and, and you know, have a little time in the evening for dinner and finishing up tasks. And then, so on the shuttle at night, we would put up window shades, you know, so that as, as you got these sunrises every hour and a half, they wouldn't wake you up. Um, we have a polling question again for you guys. I know some of you are still eating, but if you wouldn't mind, take out your phones once again. Open it up to your IWF app. Go to our session. This one is Shoot for the Moon Space, as you probably figured out. Go down to live polls, and here's the question. How many people do you think applied to be astronauts last year? You have three choices. 1,000, 18,000, 35,000, which do you think it is? I feel like I'm on Jeopardy when the music plays. <laughs> <laughs> You all, <laughs> you looked it up because the right answer is 18,000, right? That's true, yes. But that number is tremendously higher than it, it has it been is. in the past, and right? And of course, we ended up selecting only 12. So, um, you know, the odds of getting selected were very, very small. But you're right. Um, you know, in general, uh, I think the most we had ever had applied for a class before was about 8,000. And you can see we way surpassed it. So it always surprises me sometimes when people ask, oh, you know, there doesn't seem to be as much interest in the space program. And I said, not from where I sit, because I, I travel around, I talk a lot, I meet a lot of people, and you see something like that with 18,000. I said, people are still hugely interested any in what idea, we're doing in space. Any idea of why you saw that huge increase? Well, I, I do think that we do make uh, effective use of social media at NASA. And you so do we, do have, media. we do have ways of getting out, I think getting the word out, better now than we used to when, you know, it was more press releases. So I think it's just part of the way that we're able to communicate. Do you think that the movie Hidden Figures had anything to do with it? Well, it might have. And also the movie The Martian was com came out about the same time as well. And we are planning on uh, sending humans to Mars in, in the next couple of decades or so, we hope. And uh, so uh, a lot of what we're working on right now is looking at that, going to the moon in the lunar vicinity and on to Mars. Before we get to that, I just want to ask you a question about the number of women who are applying. And the number of yeah. women who are getting into the astronaut corps. Yeah. A couple of years ago, it was 50% of the class yeah, was women. Was four last, out year, of eight. last year, it was five out of 12, yeah. I think I read. Yeah. So uh, does that mean we should relax about women in the space program <laughs> or women in STEM? Well, what I would say is, 
you know, there's both good news and work to do, right? Which probably doesn't surprise anybody. It, certainly in the time I've been at NASA, um, not only are there a lot more women, but the women have risen into all of the high leadership and high visibility positions. Of course, astronauts, um, flight directors, um, you Chief, as director of the Johnson Space Center. Yes, and there's been other women center directors for NASA, the chief scientist of the agency, the chief scientist at Johnson Space Center, the chief engineer for our new spacecraft that we're developing, the Orion, the director of engineering, which is our largest organization at Johnson Space Center, all women. So, um, you know, when I joined NASA, you did not see women in those kinds of roles, other than there, there were women astronauts at that time. But you've spent a lot of your time over the last couple of years talking to students, younger students. Yeah. Um, are you trying to get more women into STEM, more Hispanic students into STEM, or both? Well, what we really need is we need, we need the people in our population to be choosing STEM fields. And of course, 50% of the population is women. And more and more, it's a very diverse community. As you see here in Houston, we really lead the country in, in really where the demographics of the country are headed. And there are a lot of Hispanics, and it's the fastest growing demographic. And they don't choose, just like women, they don't choose STEM in the percentages that anywhere near represent the, in the population. We need all those great minds. Um, so, so NASA really reaches out. I reach out, lots of um, women at NASA and um, other underrepresented engineers have the opportunity to reach out to students. And uh, you know, at JSC, I would say we, we do well for a technical organization, but we're not, still not where we want to be. So for example, 35% uh, of the people at JSC are women. And when you look at the science and engineering positions, which is about three quarters of our positions, it's about 27%. So not where we want to be, but it is better than a lot of technical organizations. What are the obstacles? Why aren't there more women in these Well, places? that's, you know, a lot of people try to understand that. Um, I think part of it starts um, earlier, which is why we have a lot of programs to talk to middle school girls and high school girls. Because if you haven't taken math and science in high school, then you've opted out unintentionally <laughs> of a lot of really exciting and interesting careers. And I, I think a lot of times uh, girls don't understand, well, what do scientists and engineers do? They solve problems. They help people. They, um, they're curious people. Um, they get to work in groups. You know, I, I had this view that like anybody in a technical field, you worked alone. Um, but in fact, if you look at NASA and many other groups, um, you, you work together in groups to solve problems. You, you work with systems engineering, and you have to have experts in a lot of different fields. And, and I think when you get that message across, um, girls are a lot more interested in thinking about, hey, maybe I should look into this. We have another polling question for you here. So again, take out those phones. You know where to find us. Here's the question. What should be the top priority for the U.S. space program? Should it be returning people to the moon? Should it be getting people to Mars? Should it be searching for life off of our planet? Should it be unmanned exploration and research? Cast your votes. We'll get this display up. you think should be the top priority? Well, you know, at NASA, what I, it's not really a choice. We actually are doing all of those. And, um, and we're doing all of them in a, in a pretty big way. So, you know, in terms of human spaceflight, um, of course, we have the International Space Station in space right now doing a lot of different science and research and development. But a lot of it is focused on what do we need to learn to uh, have longer missions back to the moon and, and on to Mars. And, and so that's, that's going on right now. We're developing a new spacecraft. We have lots of robotic missions that are currently going on and, and many more in work, including ones looking for the search for life. 
So there's been a lot of debate about whether the priority should be the moon or the priority should be Mars. My understanding that is that NASA had been talking largely about Mars as the top priority. Is that right? Yes, we've been working towards that. Um, but again, it's a stepwise. We, we have work in low Earth orbit that helps us understand about human health and performance and life support systems. Um, we're planning some infrastructure around the moon where we can test out and demonstrate a lot of the capabilities that we would need to go on to Mars and then go on to Mars. So going to the moon first, which is something this administration is talking about, would that slow down the effort to get to Mars or do you see them as being perfectly complementary? Well, I think part of it is we need to understand exactly what, what the new policy might be, but we've tried to develop a very flexible architecture. So we're working on the essential components, whether or not you spend a lot of time at the moon or go more quickly on to Mars. And that's a new spacecraft and a new heavy lift rocket, which is in development. So what's the point of getting there? Is it to do scientific experimentation or is it to colonize? Well, you know, I think NASA brings um, value in a variety of different ways. And so it's usually not just one reason, but it's several. So part of it is expanding scientific knowledge, absolutely. And, and, and both the moon and Mars have a lot to offer in terms of um, learning from them. Um, and so scientists are, are very excited about ha being able to uh, get more data on both of those. Um, it is also about understanding, sort of challenging humans and understanding, hey, at some point we may ne really need to go. Let's understand before it gets to that point what it really takes to go. And there are also things that really hum only humans can do right now, or, or we can do so much more and so much faster than robotic spacecraft at the moment. So we try to use them, you know, each in the right way. And then it'll be international collaboration, just like we have on the space station. And, and it is part of inspiring people. So it, it really fills a variety of buckets. Now, Elon Musk has talked about sending supply missions to Mars, I think by 2022, which is only a few years off, and actually sending people to Mars by 2024. Is he overly optimistic, or do you think that's a realistic <laughs> time frame? It's not so far away. Well, I don't know. It's, it's important to have visionaries, you know, and to, and to push. Visionaries? <laughs> <laughs> and to push that. So right now, um, we are kind of depending on SpaceX at NASA for a couple of things. One of the things they do for us is they have a cargo vehicle, the, the Dragon, that takes supplies to and from the International Space Station. And then we also work with SpaceX as they are developing a capability to take our crew to and from low Earth orbit, to and from the International Space Station. And so that is something we are really looking forward to, as you know, since we retired the shuttle in 2011, the United States hasn't had the capability of launching people from the United States. And I think it's hugely important um, that both SpaceX and Boeing continue that development. And we ho hope to see those first test flights next year. So that's what, in the near time frame, I hope SpaceX is focusing on. So we've been reliant on the Russians to get us to and from. Yes. Why is it so important for the US to develop its capability? Well, I think it's part of playing an a leadership role in the international community in space. We, we have that leadership role right now. Uh, with the space station, um, it was developed with five international space agencies representing 15 countries, and we're really the, the ones that sort of bring that whole coalition together and, to, and help us decide how we're gonna move forward. And uh, we're always, already starting to work with not only these five space agencies, but really a total of 12 space agencies now in terms of how you might do exploration beyond Earth. Does it really have to be in the future an international partnership and a private public venture because the price tag is so exceedingly high? Well, first of all, um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what it really takes to fund NASA. Um, everything that NASA does, which is all the robotic spacecraft, all of human exploration, aeronautics research, technology development, is all done for less than one half percent of one half of one percent of the United States federal budget. Less than one half of one percent for everything that NASA does. So, I, <laughs> to me. There's a huge return on that investment, and I really see it as an investment, not an expense, because of what we're getting out of it. New technologies that are used in a variety of industries, scientific knowledge, and to me, the, the inspiration part is just huge. I mean, it, the, it inspires people to do marvelous things in every um, aspect of life, not just science and engineering.
So I've been reading Scott Kelly's book about his time on the International yeah. Space Station, and one of the things that surprised me was talking about how um, separated uh, the different portions of the crew are, that the Russians are in one compartment, the Americans are in another compartment, and although they do spend some time together and have a traditional Friday night dinner together up there yeah. on, the, on the space station, that largely they're working independent of one another. That surprised me. Well, uh, when, when we had crews of three, which were the first several years of the station, we, we generally always had either two Americans and one Russian or two Russians and one American. And they really had to work closely together as a crew. As we built it up to six, what we did, we had the opportunity then to direct a lot of the crew's time and attention to the actual science experiments. And so different countries have sponsored different sorts of research laboratories and, and research capabilities. And so the crew members from those countries really focus on those. And that's why you see the US and a lot of like the European, Canadian, Japanese in those labs doing a lot of that work. Um, and we also train them um, on the robot arm and, and to do spacewalks. Um, so that has led to a little bit of that. But we do do some medical research that combines. And of course, when you think about Scott's mission, there were two people that were in space a year. It was Scott and his Russian cosmonaut buddy, um, Mikhail Kornienko. And so um, they were doing a lot of the same medical experiments to understand about what, it, what happens to the human body. So a strategic question for you. Should there be some limitation on exactly how much cooperation there is in space um, with people who may in the future be our adversaries in space? Because people do say that's the next battlefield. Well, NASA has definitely always been part of our foreign policy as well. And in fact, when we started working with the Russians on the space station back in 1993, it was a very specific um, foreign policy decision um, by the government and worked through the State Department. And we have basically treaty level agreements with all of these international space agencies that we work with. So it's not just something that NASA decides on our own. It, it is part of our um, foreign policy. Um, so then as you think about um, including other countries, and first of all, I will say that um, we've actually had um, some kind of participation from 98 countries associated with the International Space Station. Um, there may be principal investigators, scientists, or educational um, activities that we've done. So it, it really is truly international. It goes well beyond the initial 15. But as you look going ahead, um, NASA is actually legislatively prohibited from having any bilateral agreements with China. And so it is one of those things that's under discussion where does that keep us safer? Or does it actually um, cause other countries to work together and maybe remove U the US from a leadership position that it would already have? So that's one of those things that um, gets talked about as what is the right policy for the United States. But I would just say NASA's ready and willing to carry out um, any of those and, and that we do very well at understanding how we can actually um, do it once it's decided when to work with an, uh, another country. Uh, we're going to take questions in just a couple of minutes. You folks know where the microphones are, so you might want to queue up if you've got some questions here. But I still have some more. Okay. <laughs> um, so it has to be um, psychologically um, and emotionally challenging to spend a long stretch of time up there in space, um, particularly um, if there are any tensions amongst the crew. Do you ever get sick of people? Do you ever want to get away from people? <laughs> well, you know, my longest flight was only 11 days, so that's quite a bit different than the... But even um, 11 days could be a the, long uh, time in a cramped the time, space. Uh, uh, Scott had. So, you know, we really didn't have any issue. You know, we were focused on the mission. And, and so when you have things that you have been trained to do and, you know, people are watching to do and there's scientists that are waiting for your data or other things, you really... I mean, everybody really wants to work together. Um, and, and accomplish that. And, and I think that really gets uh, beyond a lot of that conflict. But, you know, the missions in the future, um, you know, if you go to Mars, it's going to be um, close to probably three years. And three years? Yes. And one of the things um, Scott has said in person, I don't know if I haven't had a chance to read his book, I just got a copy. Um, but in person, he, you know, somebody asks him, well, so did it feel, feel like a long time to spend a year in space? And he says, well, let me put it this way. 
If I went to a doctor tomorrow and he told me I had a year to live, my first thought would be, that's a pretty long time. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we do have to, you know, one of the things we have to understand about human health in space is also the behavioral health and how well do you sleep and, 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 the, ba and the group dynamics. And, and that is something that we try to learn at least something about before we select astronauts as well. Um, I understand we now have um, the app up and ready for you. We had a polling question for you earlier. So let's return to that. So pull out your phones. What should be the top priority in your view for NASA? Should it be returning people to the moon? Should it be getting people to Mars? Should it be searching for life elsewhere? Or should it be unmanned exploration and research? Well, you guys are tabulating that. Well, it looks like Mars is very popular. Yeah, okay. Okay, percentages are changing by the moment here. <laughs> I spoke too soon. Look at those graphs move around. Well, just again, like I said, we're actually really working on all of those, at least getting people in the lunar vicinity um, and certainly understanding what it's going to take to get to Mars and, build, and starting out on the most basic building blocks of that. We are definitely searching for life, and we're doing a lot of the unmanned exploration and research. So everybody should be happy. Good, <laughs> good. Something for everyone in this in this market basket. Um, so you mentioned some of the technological challenges yeah. of these long mis yeah. missions. What exactly is happening at the Johnson Space Center to address those challenges? What are the big ones? So um, a lot of it is understanding um, how you can live away from the Earth without being resupplied continually. So we have the opportunity when you're in low Earth orbit to send up supply ships pretty regularly. If you're going on to Mars or some other destination like that, you really don't have that capability. So the life support system is important. And on the station today, we recycle, um, it's somewhere between 80 to 85, I think around 82% of all the water and moisture, um, including we recycle all the urine and turn it back into potable water, which um, as some of our astronauts like to say, we turn yesterday's coffee into today's coffee. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, but we need to get to a higher percentage, more like 95%, re, you know, recycling of water, and we also have to do the same with, with oxygen. And so uh, we use the station for that. We work on it at Johnson Space Center. They also work on it at um, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And you need a new rocket? I understand yes. we just got tested. Right? Yes, yes. So the space launch system is under development. Um, we just did some test firing of some of the engines. Um, a lot of the structure for the very first test mission, which will fly with Orion um, in 2019, has been built. That first test flight won't have people on board because we want to look and, you know, see how everything integrates together and, and understand um, uh, the risks um, to crew members. Uh, but then the second test flight, we plan to have people on board and actually send them 70,000 kilometers past the moon, so it will be the farthest um, humans have ever gone, ever gone when we do uh, that second exploration mission. Wow. Um, do we have some questions out there? we have anybody at the yes. mic? It looks like we have someone over there on that side, if my eyes are... Uh, Jean Barber from Seattle. Uh, I have a question about space garbage. We hear that it's increasing all the time, and I'm wondering if NASA has a policy or feels like they have a um, uh, uh, solution, or yeah. are they going to be a player in trying to solve that issue? Well, you're certainly right that um, space debris, which is, is kind of what we refer to it as, it is growing. Um, and a lot of it is because of um, launches from around the world, and there's various different kind of rocket um, parts up there. And um, so there are agreements about understanding before you launch something, what is the decay of that debris? How long does it stay in orbit? What orbit is it going to be in? You know, when, it will, when will it actually burn up in the atmosphere? And, um, and in the United States, the Air Force tracks a lot of that debris. And so sometimes, for example, the space station does need to make uh, a maneuver if there's a piece that we feel is getting a little bit too close um, in order to make sure that we don't have a collision with that. Um, but that is something that um, there's a lot of work being done on. And we have people specifically at Johnson Space Center, as well as there are obviously other folks um, who 
uh, try to understand what are some of the uh, actions that we could take in the future um, that could either remove some of the larger debris so that it doesn't actually become smaller debris at some point, uh, and um, trying to understand the safety also to humans um, who are in low Earth orbit as well. Because if a piece of junk that was big hit the space, sta uh, space station, that would be it, right, potentially? Even, well, even if it's small, if it's moving in the opposite direction, it could at be a high rate of speed. moving at, you know, 30,000 miles an hour, a, a paint fleck can cause um, very, very serious damage. So, uh, so yes, we, we are concerned about that. And, and that's one of the reasons we always have vehicles that can, um, uh, crew members can climb into and, and remove themselves from the station and do an emer emergency deorbit should it cause, uh, you know, a leak and a depressurization event, for example. Just like in the movie. That was in Gravity, wasn't yeah. it? Great, thanks for the question. We have another one. Hi, just a comment. Um, I'm Katie, I'm an IWF member and also an astronaut. And I think part of the reason that we come here is to celebrate each other. So I just want to brag about Ellen, things that she <laughs> <Katie>. wouldn't say, <laughs> but are really... <laughs> but I think they just illustrate what we're all, you know, what we're all here for. And I hear things and I learn things and, and I've done that for 20 something years from Ellen. She came to NASA 20, or sorry, two years ahead of me, and she's just one of these people who's just so quietly capable and an instant leader who has that big picture, that small picture. I mean, you heard some things about the robotic arm. You didn't actually say Canada arm, too. You should say <laughs> that because there's a lot of Canadians I have said here. That. <laughs> it's my only critique of Ellen, okay? Um, but she was a pioneer on that. That Canada arm too, the new robotic arm, it's so complicated. And the way we intended to use it actually wasn't working out. And Ellen is the one that figured out what are the recipes that we can have that the people are not gonna get up there and hurt the space station. It was really significant. And in terms of even being in charge of the space station program from an astronaut office point of view, before we even understood what it was gonna look like, and Congress was changing its mind every other month about what that might look like. And last, in the area of family, for myself, um, I had a, a baby a couple years after Ellen, and he had a lot of medical things go on at the beginning of his life, and yet it was the very beginning of putting together that space station. And I so much wanted to come back to work, and I was torn about it, and I'm the kind of person who likes to have some opinions, some reinforcement, and I'll never forget, she said, you know, Katie, we're gonna have a lot of missions to that space station that you can work on, and your son's only gonna be six weeks old once. So she's a real leader, she's a hero among us, and I thank her. Thank you. <laughs> a little love, what a great yeah. testimonial. Thank well, you, Katie. Thank, I'll just, thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. That was really uh, nice of you to say that. But I, I want you all to know you can hear Katie speak tomorrow because there's a panel that's going to be talking more about this topic. So and look those forward of you who are in Tel Aviv have heard Katie before. Yes. yes. Do we have another question on this side? My eyes are failing me here. I don't. No, nope, not, not right now. Come on, folks. Aren't you curious <laughs> about this? Um, let me talk to you about some of the health things okay. that, that, oh, wait a minute, the light just came on. Yep. We do have somebody. Let's get your question in here. Hi, Carol Primdahl from Dallas. I'd like to know if you have days off up there. Yeah. Well, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between the space shuttle and the space station. So on the space shuttle, our missions were reasonably short, you know, maybe anywhere from eight to 16 days, depending on what the mission was. So on a shuttle mission, um, no days off, no time off, you know, w because um, once you launched, you wanted to get absolutely as much done as you possibly could during that mission. And so they really um, crammed as much as they could into a mission, and we were obviously really happy to do that. When you're living on the space station, and most of our crews live up there for six months at a time, of course, Scott was up there a year, uh, you, you know, you have to think uh, it's quite the difference between a sprint and a marathon, right? So we, we have a, a different kind of timeline now where we try to make it a little bit more like a normal work week where you have time off on the weekends um, and you have time to do, you know, video conferences with your families and maybe you have movie night on Saturday nights and things like that because that's really important for the beha behavioral health and to keep people really performing at their best during that whole six months. Do you ever have truly private time? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, well, let, so again, let me talk about the difference between the shuttle and the station. The shuttle, of course, is a lot smaller. <laughs> so yeah, you're always around other people, but again, it's not a very um, long period of time. And, and these are your crewmates. You've trained with them for a year. They're good friends. So you actually have a lot of fun together um, in the little bit of time, you know, time off, maybe in the evenings right before you, you know, hit, hit the sack. Um, and so, you know, I never felt that that was an issue. And if you needed privacy, there's a little curtain where the bathroom is, you know, you could go, go back in there. Now the station is so big that in fact, what people say is it's easy to lose people and not actually see people for hours and hours at a time and wonder where they are. So um, it's actually quite a, di a different environment in, the, in that way. But aren't there cameras and aren't there things attached to your body to monitor <laughs> bodily functions and that kind of uh, stuff? There are cameras, but there's not cameras in every module. And um, people do have sort of a separate, it's kind of like a phone booth size um, area, which is where they sleep, and they have a, a laptop where they can communicate, and you can call home, um, and so you actually have your own little space uh, on the space station. We have another question, I believe, uh, yeah. over here. Is there any, oh, I'm sorry, my name is Ruth Galanter, I'm from Los Angeles. Is there any hope that we will ever replace the phrase manned spacecraft <laughs> with crewed or staffed or something that's not gender specific? So actually at NASA we have changed it. That doesn't mean everybody um, you know, that talks about us does it, but um, we are the lead of human spaceflight and everything we talk about is human spaceflight and the acronym is HSF and we do not use manned anymore. Um, really. Everywhere that we had that in, in some part of our lexicon, we, we have changed. Um, again, hopefully people will continue to follow along and use that more and more, but, but we have changed that quite a while ago. All right. Over here? Uh, yes, Ilya from Panama. I have a question. You mentioned that you have different research depending on the country that's doing the studies. Do you, end of the day, share all that information between the different countries, or they keep separate research? Uh, so the, uh, the question is about sharing research. So um, we have a variety of different types of agreements and a lot of the information is shared. And, and specifically, like I'll give an example with Scott's flight again, where we had agreements with the Russian Space Agency to share all the medical data because you know, it was only two people that we were collecting data on and it was important to have more than just one. Um, and, and then there's a variety of data uh, Scott did a lot of studies that were also associated with the fact that he's an identical twin. And his, his twin, uh, Mark Kelly, was also an astronaut, though had retired by the time Scott went on this mission. So he did a bunch of data collection on the ground as well. And then we had different researchers at universities uh, across the country, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, um, who sponsored various different um, experiments. And so, any, any researcher who sponsors it really gets first crack at all the data. Um, but then after, it's usually an agreement of a year or so, and after they have that chance to analyze and publish, then the data is made public so that other researchers can use it as well. Another question. Hi, hello. I'm Marcia Forbes from Jamaica. Great job, Ellen. Thank you. Disclaimer, this is not my question. It was asked at my table. <laughs> about other forms of life or intelligence outside of the Earth, a.k.a. UFOs. So as of now, we do not know of any life, but um, one of NASA's jobs is, really is the search for life. And that's, that is one reason that we have concentrated on Mars, uh, because we think there is a possibility, at least, that sometime in Mars history there was some type of life form. We're also developing a, um, a, a robotic spacecraft that would go to Europa, um, which is one of the um, moons of Jupiter, and it's uh, known as an ocean world. And there are a lot of scientists who, who believe that there may be signs of life or that may have been, this may be an environment in which you might have the right building blocks for it as well. So we take very seriously that hugely important question of uh, could there possibly be or have been life somewhere else and we're searching first, of course, in our own solar system. Ellen, I hate to say we're out of time, but I have one okay. last question for you. Uh, if any of us has a spare quarter of a million dollars to spend, <laughs> um, we could go blasting off into space as space tourists. 
would you tell us it's worth it? <laughs> of course. Uh, it's just unlike any experience that you can possibly imagine. And, and like I said, it really fits in with this whole global citizen. And you, and you will just see the world in a whole different light. Uh, but for me also, it wasn't just about I'm in space. It was, you know, I'm working with a group of people. I'm part of a team. And we're trying to do something that brings benefits back to people here on Earth. And to me, that was what made it so meaningful as well. Ellen Ochoa, thank you so much for a thank fascinating you. conversation. And thanks to all of you, some great questions out there. It's now time for your behind the scenes sessions. Have a great afternoon and evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 8.15 for our discussion on global health, priorities and possibilities. <laughs>